2022 is here. Anybody ready for a new year? Excited? Woo, this section loves the new year. Hated 2021, yeah? No, it was fine. Uh, man, I, I'm excited for a new year. It's, it's always a joy to get a fresh start, a clean slate on a new year. And uh, 2021 was fine. 2020 was 2020. Uh, I hope 2022 is not going to be 2020. I hope it's uh, going to be an amazing year. But I got to tell you this, when I look ahead at what's coming uh, for 2022 at Harvester Christian Church, I'm really excited about what God's got in store for us. And I have no clue what's going to come other than some big things in the, the spring, the summer, and the fall. Um, we're we're going to go into Ferguson this year. That's going to be a big emphasis for us. Last week, we were all online, and we got to hear Pastor Lenny from Ferguson preach from that location. The hope is to start something, their first services in August, September of this year, and we got a lot of work to get there, and we're going to join together, and God's going to do some awesome stuff through us, and we're going to see God do some awesome stuff. Um, in the city of Ferguson and in that church, and I can't wait. Uh, there's a lot of good stuff that's happening. And I'm not just excited about what God's gonna do in Harvester Christian Church. I'm really excited about what God could potentially do for each of you individually, no matter who you are, where you live, or what circumstances you are, you are currently in. Because here's, here's the reality. Uh, what God does in you, God does in us. So here's my prayer. I want God to do something in you this year. That's my prayer. I want God to just grab a hold of your heart. I want his, his Holy Spirit to just grab you and suck you into who he is. And if he does that, I believe that we can have an amazing year together. I believe that you can have an amazing year. In fact, today, today's title of the message is A New Year, A New You. If you want a new year, then this is the year to do that, okay? And, and here's what I believe about that. I believe that if you're going to have your best year, this year can be your best year if it's your best year in Jesus. If you want 2022 to be your best year you've ever had, it has to be your best year in Jesus. Because here's the reality. 2022 is gonna have a lot of really awesome stuff that happens, but 2022 is also gonna have some pain points and a lot of pain points. And sometimes those pain points are gonna outweigh the good stuff that happens in your year. But here's the reality. If you can go through that, with Jesus in the middle of it, I promise you, you will have a better year this year than any year you try to go through it without Jesus as a part of it. So here's what I wanna do today. I want to let you know a little bit about what it looks like to be in Jesus. If you're gonna have a year in Jesus, how do you have a year in Jesus? And I gotta tell you, you're at the right place, okay? Harvester Christian Church, that's what we're about. I can't tell you how to lose weight. Uh, I can't tell you how to better your relationship uh, with your particular mom. Uh, but if those are your resolutions, if your resolution is to be in Christ, me and that we can talk about all day long. I got a whole book full of ways. Uh, it's called the Bible. Book full of ways of how you can better your relationship with Jesus. And so that's what I wanna talk about specifically. Now, Harvester Christian Church, you know that that's what we're about here. Uh, we're not just about being a church or a big church. We're not about the people uh, or the platforms. We're really about the person of Jesus. Our mission at Harvester Christian Church is this. We want to lead people to... Find and follow Jesus. Good job. Give yourself a hand. Or I'll just do it for you. There you go. Yay, us. We did it. Yeah, we're a church that wants to lead people to find and follow Jesus. And strategically, how we do that is something that we introduced a few months ago. And strategically, there's three things that want you to, we want you to do. And if you do these three things, this is how you are in Christ and Christ is in you and how he works in you and also how he works through you. As a church, this is what we're about. We want to first understand that we are a people that are in the world, okay? Our, our church does not believe that you have to completely uh, disassociate with the world and everything that's in this world. We believe that God created this world and he has plans for this world. And part of those plans is to use you in this world. So don't try to leave everything behind. We are a people in the world, even though it's painful, even though there's lost, even though there's wounds in the world, we are in the world. Now, what do we do with that? Here's what we do. Number one, we want the world to encounter Jesus. I want you to encounter Jesus. 
Because when you meet Jesus, he puts in perspective all the stuff that's in the world, all the pain that's in the world, all the wounds in the world. Jesus is the one who brings forgiveness, and he's also the one that brings healing. And the only way to get those things is to encounter Jesus. So our church, we want to be a church that encounters Jesus. But not just encounter Jesus, we want to be a church that becomes like Jesus. I don't want to just be face to face with Jesus and walk away the same old lost wounded person I was beforehand. And I don't want that for you either. I want you to encounter Jesus and then to become like Jesus. To allow the Holy Spirit to grab a hold of your heart and to start to shape you and to mold you into the likeness of the Son of God. And then once that happens, then we can unleash the hope of Jesus. What Jesus is doing in us, what Jesus is doing in you, that's what I want to unleash back into the world. In all the pain of the world, in all of the wounds of the world, I wanna take a whole bunch of people who are becoming like Jesus and unleash them into the world. I want Christ in you so that you can be in the world, so that Christ can be in the world through you. And that's what Harvester Christian Church wants to do. But here's the reality. This isn't just a Harvester Christian Church thing. This was the call and the purpose of the church from the very beginning. 2,000 years ago, this is why the church was founded. This is why Jesus came to this earth to encounter us, to live with us, to become flesh among us so that he can shape us and form us so that as we abide in him, he abides in us and he begins to mold us and shape us so that he can unleash us into the world to bring hope into this world. This is what the church has always been about. In fact, in the book of 2 Corinthians, there's a guy named Paul. He writes this letter to a specific church in Corinth, uh, in Greece, telling them, here's what it means to be the church. And here's God's calling on you as the Corinthian church, but I also think it's God's calling on us as the church at Harvester Christian Church. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 16 and 17, this is what Paul writes them. He says, from now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a what? A new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. I love that, that he is a new creation. If you want a new year and a new you, you know where you find a new you? Not in a self-help book, not in a blog. You find it in Christ as a new creation. The old has passed, the new has come. And if you want to have your best year, you have to have your best year in Jesus. So here's what I want to do today. I want you to take this passage and I want to pull apart some of the different phrases in this passage. And I want to show you how it aligns with the mission of the church in general and some of the words that we've used at Harvester Christian Church. If you're going to have a year in Jesus at Harvester Here's the very first thing that I want you to know, that you are in the world. We have to understand that right off the bat. We can't forget that we are people in the world. This is how Paul puts it in the reminder he gave the Corinthian church. He says, from now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. We regard no one according to the flesh. Here's what Paul means by that. Essentially, he's telling them, we have to change the way that we view people. We have to change the way that that we view the world. We have to take a, a deeper look at people and realize that people are more than their flesh. You can't just look at someone on the outside and say, here's what I know about you. You are everything that the outside of you says. People are more than the color of their skin. People are more than their political beliefs. People are more than the the brands of clothing they wear. People are more than the size of their wallet. We can't just look at the world and judge the world according to the flesh, but rather what scripture teaches us is that there's something deeper in every single one of us. There's something deeper in every single person that each of us, every person who has ever walked the planet Earth Deep inside of them, they have ingrained in them this deep spiritual sense, this this imago Dei, this image of God. We are more than just flesh and blood. Every person in this world is created by God with his image deeply implanted into them. Which means this, and here's the truth, that when you view people according to their flesh, you will always be offended by their brokenness. Okay, let me say that again. When you are viewing people according to their flesh, the result of that is you're gonna be offended at the world. 
You're going to be offended by their brokenness. And I don't know about you, but I'm hoping that 2022 is a year of less being offended. Um, man, these last, like, this is, we are an offended people. Like, someone says something, I'm offended. Someone does something, I'm offended. You are that, I'm offended. You said that, I'm offended. Like, we're, we're just an offended people. And if we're going to have a year in Christ, we can't be offended at the brokenness of the world. Rather, we need to be brokenhearted for the brokenness in the world. Let me say that again. Jesus didn't call us to be offended by the world. He called us to be brokenhearted for the world. To look at the world and realize that, man, I see your pain. I see, I see the ugliness of it. I see, I see the outward flesh, but I know you were meant for more. I know there's something deeper in you. There's a bigger calling, and, I, and I'm brokenhearted that, that there, there's this gap between the two of, of the way things are versus the way that things should be. We shouldn't be offended at that. We should be brokenhearted by that. And so practically, here's how you can have a better year this year when it comes to the world. It's this. Choose empathy over apathy. Choose empathy over apathy. You know who's really good at this? My wife. My wife is... Man, Rachel, she is one of the most kind-hearted people I have ever met. In fact, I met her in college, and we were in a friend group together. And even as just friends, I looked at her, and I remember telling another of our friends that this is as close to a female Jesus as I have ever met. Like, the heart of this woman and the way that she cares for people, specifically people who are going through tough times and pains, like, she would always step in and love people. Like, when someone else was hurting, she would cry along with them. Whenever uh, she, she saw something in the news about someone we've never met before, she would cry over it. She would read a book, a fiction book, and cry over it. We'd watch a movie, she'd cry over it. It's like there was this, this deep sense of feeling that she had for other people where she could empathize with them. And then I looked at myself, and I'm like, I haven't cried in years. <laughs> and as a college boy, it, it began to bother me a little bit. Because I finally saw someone who, who seemed to be in touch with the heart of God. And then I looked at my own heart, and I'm like, God, why am I not feeling that? Why am I not feeling the pain and the brokenness of this? And so here's a prayer that I began to pray, and it's a prayer that I would give you to pray this year as well. It's this prayer. Father, break my heart for what breaks your heart. If you want to see the world differently, ask God to break your heart for the things that break his heart. You think God is up on his throne just being offended at everything he sees? You know what he's up on his throne doing? Looking down, just brokenhearted. Grieving on the things that he sees happening in this world. And his, and his heart breaks for those things. And man, that's the kind of heart I want to have. And that's the, that's the kind of heart I want our church to have is that we, we see the pain in this world and instead of being offended when someone is acting out or we see someone acting out on the news or we see someone hurting or we see someone sitting, instead of being offended, we first grieve. We first listen or we first mourn or we, we first pray. I, I think, man, this is, this is what changes things. And I know some of you are thinking, how does, how does empathy change anything? How does me getting sad or me mourning or me grieving in the middle of someone's pains, how does that change them? The reality is, empathy rarely changes somebody else's heart, but it will always change your heart. When you begin to empathize with the pain that other people are going through, that doesn't automatically change their heart but it begins to change your heart. It begins to, to open some things in you that I think the Holy Spirit wants to do in you. And when you can begin to empathize with pain, that's whenever I think Jesus can step in and start tinkering with things and start messing with you. So when it comes to the world, choose empathy over apathy. The second thing that you can do this year is to encounter Jesus. If we really do live in a lost and wounded world that's experiencing pain, then we have to bring Jesus into the mix. Jesus changes our perspective on the world, but it also changes our perspective on us. In fact, this is what Paul said in that passage about his encounter with Jesus. He says, even though we, including himself, even though we once regarded Christ according to his flesh, we regard him thus no longer. 
Essentially, Paul was saying, there, there was a time in my life, Paul was saying, that where I looked at Jesus and I thought, he was maybe a, a good teacher, but really he's, he's nobody different than anybody else. He's just human, he's just flesh, he's just a nobody from Nazareth. And then something changed for Paul. And you know where that change started? It started on the Damascus Road when he encountered Jesus. He came face to face with the person of Jesus and he saw Jesus one way before that, but now that he's come face to face with the Son of God in the flesh, he's like, you're more than flesh and blood. You're more than I thought you were. And it changed the way that he viewed Jesus. And it changed the way that he viewed the world after that. And so here's the reality, church. If you want to be a better human being this year, maybe a great place to start is encountering the person who was the best human being ever. If you want to be a better human, why not encounter Jesus, the person who put on flesh but lived through that flesh in the best possible way? Because here's the truth. You cannot be the best person you were meant to be until you encounter the best person who ever was. And if you're going to try to step into this year and be a better person without encountering the best person, you're going to end up in the same place you were in 2020 and 2021. Like the only way to have a different kind of life is to live through the life of a different kind of person. And that person is Jesus. So practically, here's how you can do that this year. Prioritize FaceTime with Jesus. Prioritize some FaceTime with Jesus. Now, 2020, 2021, that was the year of Zoom. That was the year of Microsoft Teams. That was the year of FaceTime. And we we did those things because we valued the relationship or we valued the network. We valued the person on the other side. And even though we were apart from each other, we still wanted to be together. So we tried to figure out ways that we could prioritize that relationship, right? Right? What if in 2022, we prioritize the same thing, but with Jesus? What if we got some face time with Jesus? What if we prioritized spending time with Jesus? Now, now how do we do that in 2022? I think a great way is just to increase the frequency of time that you spend with Jesus. Here's the reality. I need to call my mom more, okay? I really do. I need to have some face time with my mom. Usually it's only on birthdays that we talk. Um, but she means a lot to me, and so I need to increase the frequency at which I call her. I need to set a time of day, a time of the month where I call her. And I think some of us need to do with that, that with Jesus, to be intentional about these are the times that I am intentionally prioritizing as Jesus encounter times. And I got to tell you, Sunday is a great time to prioritize as Jesus encounter time. For 2,000 years, people have been gathering and prioritizing this time to spend with Jesus. And I think we need to do a better job at that. In fact, um, that is kind of gone by the wayside over the last few years for a lot of people who have this tremendous faith in Jesus. They love Jesus, but the the time with Jesus has become fewer and fewer. In fact, uh, do you know how often a Christian person attends a church gathering like this? How often do you think? Stats say 1.8 times a month. A believer goes to a church service like this. Now, for some of you, you're like, that's me, right? That's me. Some of you are like, this is the first time I've been here in two or three years, so I'm like, once a year, maybe. Here's what we need to do is just increase that. And my, my recommendation, just increase it by one. Start with that. If you are a, a 1.8 person, maybe in 2022, become a 2.8 person. I don't know how you do the point eight, but leave early like some of you guys do uh, (laughs) at the end of service. Or if you're a two person, become a three person. If you're a four person, you're like, I'm here four four weekends out of the month, become a five person. We'll open the door for you on Monday. There's a prayer room, you can come pray. But your encounters don't just have to be limited to this space either. Increase your encounter with Jesus throughout the week. How many times uh, a week do you spend with Jesus? And And I mean with Jesus. Not just, not just randomly praying throughout the day in the office. I mean, you've dedicated this time of nobody here's voice will be heard but the voice of Jesus. Increase those times and that amount of time that you spend with Jesus. And here's what will happen. If you prioritize FaceTime with Jesus this year, I believe that 
by the end of this year, you will look more like Jesus than you did today. That you will sound more like Jesus than you did today. Your heart will beat the heart of Jesus more at the end of this year than it did today. And eventually what happens is you become like Jesus. You become like Jesus, which is the third thing. If we're going to have a year in Jesus, we have to prioritize becoming like Jesus. This is how Paul talks about becoming like Jesus in that passage we just read. It says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Therefore, if, he uses the word if because it's your choice. Like there's, not everybody is automatically in Christ, but if, any, if everybody, therefore, anybody who is in Christ, what happens to them is they become a new creation. Which also means that those who are not in Christ are an old creation. They're the original selves. There's not this new year, new you. There's not this becoming more like Jesus. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Here's the joy of being in Christ, is that when you're in Christ, and and the, the image of baptism is that image of being in Christ, what begins to happen is he begins to, to recreate you. When the, when the Holy Spirit comes inside of you, he doesn't just chill and do nothing. He begins to form you and to shape you. And catch this, that everybody is created in the image of God. Everybody is created in the image of God. But God is not done creating you until you are formed into the image of Jesus. Can I tell you this? God is not done with you yet. He's created you and he's planted this value, this imago Dei inside of you. But just because you're created in the image of God, that doesn't mean that you look like the son of God. And so part of the task of creation is that that you you become a new creation. And in this new creation, the Holy Spirit begins to form you into the image of Jesus. Not that you attend church on Sundays, that's not the image of Jesus, but it's, it's your character, your mentality, the way that you process the world, the way that you view people, the way that you, you view yourself, it begins to change. And that's what makes you different than the rest of the world. Everybody in the world has been created with the value of the Imago Dei. But when you're formed into the image of Jesus, that's what makes you different. It's not what makes you better or more valuable. It's just what makes you more like the son of God. If you want to have your best year ever, let the Holy Spirit form you and shape you into the image of God. Now, how do you do that? Practically this year, here's what I would recommend. Uh, Let's go back. Back one slide there. There we go. Pursue habits that form you. Pursue habits that form you this year. If you want to be shaped, habits are the things that shape you. Habits are the things that form you. And unfortunately, many of us have a lot of habits that aren't forming us. They're deforming us if we think about it. Yeah? How many of you have already gotten the notification on your phone today that you have spent too much screen time on your phone? Anybody that already popped up today? Yeah, Uh, here's a question. Does that habit form you? Is that making you a better person? Is your phone making you a better person? That time you spend in the death scroll on Instagram, is that forming you, viewing everybody else's lives and judging them because they're on amazing vacations and you're stuck with your spouse? Is that forming you? Is that habit creating something in you like Jesus? Or look at, your, look at your calendar, your schedule. How many of you have made a habit of being busy, 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 Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, I work, 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 work. Is that habit forming you? Is it creating you into the image of Jesus? Is it building you up or is it building your company up at your expense? What if this year we had different habits and, and different rhythms that form us into the image of Jesus where we can become like him? What if this year... We had Sabbath as part of our weekly rhythm, a time where you just take off. Like you you close the book on work, you close the book on school, and you just spend time with God. And I'm not just talking spending time with God in the flow of life. Yes, do that. On your way to work, do that. While you're at work, do that. When you're with the kids, do that. But when do you just shut it off, and instead of being a human doing, you just become a human being, where I'm just being with God, and I'm hearing only the voice of God and not the voice of my phone, not the voice of news, not the voice of people I even care about, but only hearing the voice of God. I think we need to spend time with these kinds of habits that form us. 
of praying, of times of silence, times of solitude, and yes, even Bible reading. I know many of you probably made that your New Year's resolution, that you're going to read the Bible more this year. And man, good on you. We need to read the Bible more this year, every single one of us. But I know some of you, you're, you're not able to do that because you're not exactly sure how to read the Bible. You're like, you read a verse or two, and you're like, I read that. I don't understand it, but is that what you want to God? Is that good? Like, we good now? Am I formed? I read those two verses. Am, am I good now? Do I do that again tomorrow? Just pick another two verses? Um, here's what I want to do. I want to give you a, a strategy for reading a book in the Bible, okay? Some of you need this. So if you need to write this down, write this down. A, a good strategy for reading a book, if you're someone who's like, I read and I don't really understand what I'm reading, a good strategy is overlapped reading. Overlapped reading. It's, it's a way that I just read through my devotion time when I'm studying a book of the Bible. This, this works well specifically with shorter books in the New Testament, like Galatians or Ephesians, Philippians, anything Paul, James wrote, John, uh, these are great as well. It's just overlapped reading where you just read one chapter and then you read a second chapter and then the next day you overlap two of the chapters. chapters. So for example, on uh, day one, I would read Galatians chapter one. Day two, I would overlap and read Galatians chapter one again, but then add chapter two. The next day, I would read chapter two again and then add a new chapter, chapter three. The following day, I would read chapter three again and then read chapter four and go throughout the entire Bible. Here's what that does. That allows you to read one book two times and you're reading the same chapter two days in a row, so you're processing new information with information that you've just read and learned. It's a great way to read the Bible and start to understand it more. And it's also a great way to, to let the scriptures begin to form you and shape you and change the way that you think about them. It's a habit that is forming. And I think when we can develop these kinds of habits, this is the person that I think Jesus wants to do this next thing on. This is the kind of person that Jesus wants to unleash into this world to bring the hope of Jesus into the world. Now, here's, here's how Paul describes unleashing the hope of Jesus. He says that the old has passed away, and behold, the new has come. The old has passed away, behold, the new has come. You know, our hope as a church is to be a church that goes into this world and unleashes the hope of Jesus in this world so that we can make a difference in this world, so that we can bring something new and fresh, and that's the person of Jesus and his perspective into this world. And Paul says, man, whenever you're in Christ and he recreates you into this new creation and then you're released into this world, what begins to happen is that the old of this world, the painful, the, the ugly parts of the world slowly begins to pass away and behold, the new has come. Now I love this because it's not the new will come, it's not that pray for the new to come in the future. What Paul talks about is that there's this new that is, that is coming right now. When Paul looked at the world, he wasn't waiting for the heavens, the new heavens and the new earth to come someday. When Paul looked at the world, he was beginning to notice little things of heaven sprouting up all throughout the world. That people's mentalities were changing that the way we treated each other was changing. And he, he began to realize that, that the church's job was not just to pray for heaven to come, but the church's role was to prepare because heaven is coming now. And it's to prepare the hearts of people to receive heaven today. You know, I really believe that most Christians believe that heaven is something that's far off into the future. And I think that mentality really hurts us. I think that mentality actually really hurts the church too. When we look at heaven as something off in the distant future, then what that means is we have nothing to unleash today. Man, if we can get, get a hold of this idea that, that God wants to do something today, that yes, there is this heaven that's coming, and yes, one day everything will be, it'll be made new, that you will be made new. All the old will, will be made new. But God is doing that work today as well. And when we can get that mentality, that's when we can begin to unleash the hope of Jesus today. You know, Paul, when he says this, that the old has passed away and the new has come, he's actually referring to a passage in Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 43, verse 18 and 19, it says this. It says, do not remember the past events. Pay no attention to the things of old. 
Look, I am about to do something new. Even now it is coming. Do you not see it? Indeed, I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Church, here's the reality. God is doing something new. Do you see it? Do you see it? Do you want to be a part of it? You can be a part of it. That's the invitation of a Christian is to be a part of it. And that's why as a church we say, man, we, we don't just want to exist to gather in a building. We want to exist to unleash the hope of Jesus out there. Practically this year, here's what that looks like. That if you're going to unleash the hope of Jesus, that means unleashing heaven in someone's hell. Unleashing heaven this year in someone's hell. Three, three ways that I think that you can do that. Number one is just invite someone to encounter Jesus. Invite someone to encounter Jesus. There's a lot of pain in this world, and there's people that you love, people that you care about, people in your communities and groups that they're going through hell. You know what Jesus has called you to do? To step into that and unleash the hope of Jesus into it. But not just you, but you bring Jesus so that they encounter Jesus in that as well. One of my hopes this year is that every single one of you will invite someone to be a part of this encounter right here. Whether that be sharing online if you're an online only person or if you're part of the group that, that attends in person, I hope that you'll invite someone to be a part of what happens here. Because here's, here's what I believe about this setting right here. This setting is all about encountering Jesus. This, this isn't meant to uh, inflate egos. This isn't meant to show that we are a big gathering of people. This moment right here is all about coming into the presence of Jesus. And can I tell you this? There's people in your life who need the presence of Jesus in their life. There are people in your life who are going through hell and they have nobody to help them and they have no savior and you know the savior. You know him. Like invite them to encounter the one who can bring them healing, who can save them, who can help them to be found. Invite them in to encounter Jesus. Unleash a little bit of the heaven that's inside of you into their life and invite them to be a part of this gathering. And, and here's the other thing that I'm really excited about this year is that one of the little tweaks we're making uh, to things that we do at Harvester is we're actually going to unleash some heaven into Nicaragua every time you invite someone to be a part of Harvester Christian Church. This year what we're gonna do is when you invite a guest and they come to Harvester Christian Church, and they let us know that they're here, instead of us giving them a gift card, which is what we've done in the past, we're actually going to take that and make a donation to a school in San Benito, Nicaragua, where that money is gonna to go to provide education, food, and education supplies to a kid there who needs schooling. And so here's the reality. When you invite someone to be a part of Harvester Christian Church, it's not about uh, building some kind of machine or reputation with our name. It's about unleashing heaven in two people's lives, their life and a kid in Nicaragua. So if you wanna unleash heaven, invite. The other thing is, if you wanna unleash heaven, give as well. Be generous. Uh, a few weeks ago, we did this uh, giving initiative called Give Hope. And during that 10-day period of Give Hope in November, you guys gave $300,000, over $300,000 that goes outside of these walls. It doesn't go to Harvester Christian Church and it doesn't go to anybody's salary or paying any bills or none of the ministries and all the good things that we do in this body. It doesn't go to that. It goes towards other things in this world outside of our facilities. Now, what I'm really excited about is the culture that that's gonna create. And here's why we're doing Give Hope because I wanna create a culture in our heart where we are open-handed with what God has given us and that we use those not as just things to brag about how blessed we are, but those are things that we use to bless other people. And man, if we can get a hold of that, man, the, the hope that we can unleash in this world. So we're gonna give hope two times a year. We're gonna do it two times a year, once in November, which we just did, and then we're always gonna do it again in June. The November one's gonna be focused around local initiative or global initiatives. The June one is gonna be focused around local initiatives. And my hope is that in June when we do it, um, we're probably going to do something with the, the city of Ferguson, Missouri, because here's the reality. I wanna see hope unleashed in Ferguson, Missouri. I want you guys here in St. Charles County and in Lincoln County to give generously to a place that God is already working in and doing some amazing things in and he's calling us to partner with. And, and I wanna see us unleash it there. And so I hope that you'll participate in that. You guys gave 300,000 this time. My hope is that by the end of this year, 
you, you guys, Harvester has given over half a million dollars to unleash heaven in somebody's hell. And I can't wait to see what you guys do through that. Now, here's the final thing that you can do to unleash heaven in someone's hell. And this might be the hardest one of all. It's this. Show up. Show up. And here's what I mean. When someone's going through hell, show up in their hell. Step into it. To, to, to go back into it. We have this mentality of Jesus has called us out of the pain of the world to encounter Jesus, to become like Jesus. God, don't call me back into the pain of this world. God is calling you back into the pain of this world. If we're gonna be a church that unleashes the hope of Jesus, when that hope is unleashed in us, we have to then take that and step into somebody else's pain. Step out into somebody's grief, step into someone's sorrow, step into someone's mourning. My hope this year is that when you have someone in your life who is going through divorce, you step into it and you have the conversation and you love them. When you have someone in your life who is, who's lost a, a loved one to cancer, that you don't just pray from afar and send a card, but you step into it and you, you be, be Jesus incarnate there. Is it when you see someone hungry that you'll, you'll, you'll step into that and not just throw food or money their way, but you'll hear a story and step into that hell, but don't just bring you, don't bring the, the wisdom of the world. Bring what Jesus is doing in you. Bring, bring how he's forming you. And if you're not being formed in Jesus, maybe don't step into it yet. But what we need less of is people who are less like Jesus trying to pretend like they are Jesus. Let Jesus form you. And as he's forming you, unleash that into other people's lives. Here's what I'm hoping, I'm, I'm really hoping this. I'm hoping that 2022 is your best year ever. In order for that to happen, it has to be your best year in Jesus. A self-help book isn't gonna give you a best year. Losing a little weight is not gonna give you your best year ever. Making a commitment to call your mom is not gonna make it the best year ever. Being in Jesus, that could change everything. This year, encounter Jesus. Become like Jesus, and then unleash the hope of Jesus in a lost and wounded world.